Uh, this evening, I've, I've changed the text just a bit. You'll see it displayed on the screen, I trust. We're going to be looking at Daniel chapter 9. We're going to be looking at what's, um, oh, what we understand to be or call the 70 weeks of Daniel. And I think I've already told you in uh, my prayer why it is we're going to do that. But what I'd like to do is begin by reading uh, Daniel chapter 9, beginning in verse 1 through verse 27. Daniel chapter 9, beginning in verse 1. And the reason I'm doing this is just so we understand the context in which the 70 weeks of Daniel are given to Daniel. So this is what we read beginning in verse 1. In the first year of Darius, the son of Ahasuerus of Median descent, who was made king over the kingdom of the Chaldeans, in the first year of his reign, I, Daniel, observed in the books the number of the years which was revealed as the word of the Lord to Jeremiah the prophet for the completion of the desolations of Jerusalem, namely 70 years. So I gave my attention to the Lord God to seek him by prayer and supplications with fasting, sackcloth, and ashes. I prayed to the Lord my God and confessed and said, Alas, O Lord, the great and awesome God who keeps his covenant and loving kindness for those who love him and keep his commandments. We have sinned, committed iniquity, acted wickedly and rebelled, even turning aside from your commandments and ordinances. Moreover, we have not listened to your servants, the prophets, who spoke in your name to our kings, our princes, our fathers, and all the people of the land. Righteousness belongs to you, O Lord, but to us open shame as it is this day, to the men of Judah, the inhabitants of Jerusalem, and all Israel, those who are nearby and those who are far away in all the countries to which you have driven them because of their unfaithful deeds which they have committed against you. Open shame belongs to us, O Lord, to our kings, our princes, and our fathers because we have sinned against you. To the Lord our God belong compassion and forgiveness for we have rebelled against him nor have we obeyed the voice of the Lord our God to walk in his teachings which he has set before us through his servants the prophets indeed all Israel has transgressed your law and turned aside not obeying your voice so the curse has been poured out on us along with the oath which is written in the law of Moses the servant of God for we have sinned against him. Thus he has confirmed his words which he had spoken against us and against our rulers who ruled us to bring on us great calamity. For under the whole heaven there has not been done anything like what was done to Jerusalem. As it is written in the law of Moses, all this calamity has come, has come on us, yet we have not sought the favor of the Lord our God by turning from our iniquity and giving attention to your truth. Therefore, the Lord has kept the calamity in store and brought it on us. For the Lord our God is righteous with respect to all his deeds which he has done. But we have not obeyed his voice. And now, O Lord, our God, who have brought your people out of the land of Egypt with a mighty hand and have made a name for yourself, as it is this day, we have sinned. We have been wicked. O Lord, in accordance with all your righteous acts, let now your anger and your wrath turn away from your city, Jerusalem, your holy mountain. For because of our sins and the iniquities of our fathers, Jerusalem and your people have become a reproach to all those around us. So now, our God, listen to the prayer of your servant and to his supplications. And for your sake, O Lord, let your face shine on your desolate sanctuary. O oh my God, incline your ear and hear. Open your eyes and see our desolations in the city which is called by your name. For we are not presenting our supplications before you on account of any merits of our own, but on account of your great compassion. O oh Lord, hear. O oh Lord, forgive. O oh Lord, listen and take action. For your own sake, O oh my God, do not delay because your city and your people are called by your name. 
Now, while I was speaking and praying and confessing my sin and the sin of my people Israel and presenting my supplication before the Lord my God in behalf of the holy mountain of my God, while I was still speaking in prayer, then the man Gabriel, whom I had seen in the vision previously, came to me in my extreme weakness about the time of the evening offering. He gave me instruction and talked with me and said, O Daniel, I have now come forth to give you insight with understanding. At the beginning of your supplications, the command was issued, and I've come to tell you, for you are highly esteemed. So give heed to the message and gain understanding of the vision. Seventy weeks have been decreed for your people in your holy city to finish the transgression, to make an end of sin, to make atonement for iniquity, to bring in everlasting righteousness, to seal up vision and prophecy, and to anoint the most holy place. So you are to know and discern that from the issuing of a decree to restore and rebuild Jerusalem until Messiah the Prince there will be seven weeks and 62 weeks. It will be built again with plaza and moat, even in times of distress. Then after the 62 weeks, the Messiah will be cut off and have nothing. And the people of the prince who is to come will destroy the city and the sanctuary. And its end will come with a flood. Even to the end, there will be war. Desolations are determined. And he will make a firm covenant with the many for one week. But in the middle of the week, he will put a stop to sacrifice and grain offering. And on the wing of abominations will come one who makes desolate, even until a complete destruction, one that is decreed, is poured out on the one who makes desolate. May the Lord bless his word to our hearing this evening. Now, obviously, we've looked at a lot of things in this text, but we're going to try to understand... Daniel 9, 24 through 27. Again, the text that has to do with the 70 weeks of Daniel. Now, as you know, we've been looking at reasons why we have to be optimistic about the future. And the first one, of course, is the fact that Jesus is now reigning over the earth, that his reign is not one that's going to begin in the future when he comes the second time. His reign began after he died, after he was raised from the dead and ascended into heaven. That was his coronation day. And right now he is reigning and in control, complete control of everything that happens in this world. Jesus is reigning now. Our optimism, secondly, comes from the fact that the Father promised the Lord Jesus Christ something in particular as a reward for his work. He said, sit at my right hand until I make all your enemies a footstool for your feet. The Father has promised to subdue every single one of Jesus' enemies under his feet before he returns. Now, as you know, our Lord Jesus Christ in his earthly ministry, his first coming, bound the strong man. He bound Satan so that he could plunder his house. And that's what he has been doing for the past 2,000 years. This is a part of that subjection of his enemies under his feet. Now, we saw that the last enemy that he has to overcome is death. And that enemy will be defeated or subdued at his second coming when he comes to raise the dead. And that means that all his other enemies the Father has promised to subdue under his feet will all be subdued before he returns in his second coming to raise the dead. Now that should make a significant impact on this world before Jesus Christ comes again. The Bible tells us that it will. We've seen several passages that indicate the results of such a subjection of Christ's enemies and the extension of the kingdom of heaven throughout the world. This should make us optimistic matter of fact, should give us a great deal of optimism. But now, notwithstanding all that we've seen so far, there are still those who would disagree with this understanding of Scripture. Not that we can be optimistic about the distant future of the church, thankfully. Every Christian is optimistic about that. 
we all believe that in the end our Lord Jesus Christ is going to conquer the earth, that he is going to bring the new heavens and the new earth, that they will come, and that all of his people will be blessed forever with him um, in this new heavens and this new earth, in that newly recreated paradise where there is nothing of the effects of sin. We all agree on that. The disagreement has more to do with what we can expect to happen on this earth before Jesus Christ comes again. Now, basically we disagree on how the subduing of this enemy or of his enemies can bring a glorious change in the world. Things are not going to remain the same. We disagree on that. Now, what is it that they believe that is standing in the way of this future that we've seen with regard to Christ reigning and the subjection of his enemies? Well, two things in particular. They see within the scripture that there are certain passages that promise us tribulation that paint a picture of great difficulty that the church has to go through and even great difficulty for the entire world. Now, if that's the case, how can there be a glorious future? That's one thing. The second thing has to do with what we call the imminent return of our Lord Jesus Christ. There are several passages of scripture that seem to indicate that Jesus could come at any time. And if that is the case, if he could come, let's say right now, while the sermon is ongoing, how can we expect a glorious future? It hasn't happened yet. If he could come at any time, that means it doesn't necessarily have to happen before he returns. Well, those are a couple of things that we need to consider as we uh, try to move the objections out of the way to this glorious future the Lord is promising us. Now, let's begin by considering the first, the first objection. How can we expect a golden age when the Bible seems to indicate that there are serious troubles ahead for the church and for the world? What I'd like for us to do is consider the passages that seem to indicate there are difficult times ahead. And then to consider why those passages really do not prevent a glorious or golden age for the church. Now I'm sort of uh, going to deal with you know, what those passages are and then sort of give the antidote to them so we'll kind of go in, in, that, in that order. Now what I'd like to do first is deal with pa certain passages that tell us that we can expect tribulation. Now by the way, I should mention this at the outset. As I was preparing this sermon, it's one of those that gets longer and longer and longer and it finally reached a point where I said, this is just too much. We're not gonna be able to absorb all of this in one sitting. And maybe what I have right here is going to be too much anyway. But I, I divided it up so that we're going to look at those passages that have to do with persecution and tribulation. And that that has to do with Daniel 9 this evening. And perhaps next week we'll look at the Olivet Discourse and the book of Revelation. As you can see, that's a lot to cover in one sermon. So I, I thought it would be better to divide it up. So first of all, let's consider those passages that seem to indicate, or actually do tell us, that as Christians, we should expect in this world tribulation and persecution because we are followers of the Lord Jesus Christ. And let me give you a few examples. John chapter 15, verses 18 through 21. If the world hates you, you know that it has hated me before it hated you. If you are of the world, the world would love its own. But because you are not of the world, but I chose you out of the world, because of this, the world hates you. Remember the word that I said to you. A slave is not greater than his master. If they persecuted me, they will also persecute you. If they kept my word, they will keep yours also. But all these things they will do to you for my name's sake, because they do not know the one who sent me. Very clearly, our Lord Jesus Christ is telling us that we can expect to be hated by the world. Matthew 5, verses 10 through 12. Blessed are those who have been persecuted for the sake of righteousness, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when people insult you and persecute you and say and falsely say all kinds of evil against you because of me. Rejoice and be glad, for your reward in heaven is great. 
For in the same way they persecuted the prophets who were before you. Paul says to Timothy in 2 Timothy 3, 10 through 12, Now you followed my teaching, conduct, purpose, faith, patience, love, perseverance, persecutions, and sufferings, such as happened to me at Antioch, at Iconium, and at Lystra, what persecutions I endured. And out of them all the Lord rescued me indeed. All who desire to live godly in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. And then finally, John 16, 33, these things I have spoken to you so that you may have peace. In the world you have tribulation, but take courage, I have overcome the world. Now I hope you realize, or I think you can see, that these passages by themselves seem to uh, mitigate seem to exclude a golden future because it promises us a future full of persecution and tribulation. Now, how do we reconcile this with a golden future? Well, I think the last verse gives us the key. This certainly has been true from the time of Jesus Christ to the present, although in varying degrees, and it will continue as long as the kingdom of darkness exerts the kind of power that it does in the world as long as people's hearts are bound up in sin and in darkness, they are going to hate the light. That's why they're going to hate you. But let's not forget that Jesus has overcome the world. He defeated the devil on the cross, as we've already seen, and he is in the process of plundering his house. And as the kingdom of heaven continues to advance and fills the whole earth, and as his enemies are systematically defeated, and certainly this persecution should decline. Now, yes, Jesus told his disciples there was persecution ahead of them, and there certainly was. They were persecuted. Many of them were killed. And there is persecution and hatred and tribulation still ahead of us. But that doesn't mean that this situation could radically change overnight if the Lord determined to do so. He could bring worldwide peace in a moment. Again, if we didn't learn anything else from the Great Awakening as we considered that last uh, Reformation series, we should understand that when the Lord determines to do something, he can do it with infinite ease. He spoke the universe into being with a word. He can change this puny little planet, its inhabitants, much more easily. Now, again, the Lord could do this overnight if that's what he wanted to do. There's certainly no lack of power on his part. It's just the question of what it is he really has planned to do. But again, the point for our purposes this evening is this, the fact that there is going to be persecution and tribulation during the present time, when the kingdom of darkness has the kind of grip that it has on the world, is really not an argument that as the kingdom of heaven advances, that things could not radically change and that there could not be a golden age. What Jesus said to his disciples is true. But it doesn't necessarily mean that things aren't going to change as the kingdom of heaven advances. But, of course, you know, there is another group of passages in Scripture that seem to indicate that there are terrible times ahead of us, not only for us, but also for the world. Passages such as Daniel 9 that we've read in our reading of Scripture, the Olivet Discourse, which is what we're looking at in Mark chapter 13, and the book of Revelation, which many believe is painting a very uh, dire uh, picture of the future just prior to Christ's return. Now again, as much as I'd like to cover all of these in one sitting, it's just too much to deal with. So what we're going to do is focus on just the first passage, Daniel 9, verses 24 through 27. Now, I, I asked if, if they would put that up on the screen. I suppose now is as good a time as any to do that because we're going to make, be making several references to this. And the reason why I would deal with it at all is not because in our denomination we have any difficulty with that. Uh, I think we all pretty much agree that this passage is not something that's standing in our way in the future, but something that has actually happened in the past. But the reason why I want us to look at it is because so many churches today teach that this passage is painting a bleak future for us 
we are all of us affected in one way or another by dispensationalism, some of us a lot, some of us perhaps just very little. But because it is so prominent, I thought I would deal with this. Now, it's not the 70 weeks that are really a problem. I think uh, pretty much everybody's agreed that the first 69 weeks have already been fulfilled. It's the 70th week that presents the problem. And this 70th week, as I've said, does not really present a problem to the awmill or to the postmill, but it does to the dispensationalist who is the, the pre-mill. Now, not, not all pre-mills, but dispensational premillennialism. And again, as I said, because this is so prominent, I think we need to look at it. Now, dispensationalism, a big word. I've used it a number of times. I hope you understand something about it. But let me just tell you what they believe regarding the 70th week of Daniel or the 70 weeks in general. They do believe that Jesus is going to come before the thousand years, before the millennium. That's why they are called premillennialists. And they believe that when he does, that he is going to set up a distinctly Jewish kingdom on earth. That's what makes them dispensationalists, okay? Is they believe that there is a distinctly Jewish future when God fulfills the promises that he made to Israel that they believe have not been yet fulfilled, that he will fulfill it during that time. There are premillennialists called historic premillennialists that believe that Jesus is going to come before the thousand years, but they do not believe that the millennium that he sets up, the kingdom he sets up, is distinctly Jewish. This is something that dispensationalists believe. But before Jesus comes to set up that kingdom, he is going to return partway in the dispensationalist mind uh, seven years earlier to rapture his church out of the world and to start, in their estimation, the 70th week of Daniel's prophecy, a seven-year period of tribulation for the world. They believe that that's future. They believe it's going to happen after the church is raptured out of the world but it's still something that is future that paints a bleak, uh, a bleak future for the church. Now they believe that this is what Jesus was talking about in the Olivet Discourse. This is what they believe Jesus was referring to in the book of Revelation. This 70th week, this time of great tribulation, this seven year period. Now actually, we do believe that this is partly true, that all these things really are speaking of the same event but we believe it's not in the future, but it's in the past. Now, again, if dispensationalism is right, there are perilous times ahead for the church, and therefore not a great deal of optimism. Most dispensationalists today believe that we're just kind of holding on, trying to save as many people as we can on this sinking ship as it's going under. But that's kind of how the world is going. It's going to be winding down, going further and further. They don't expect things to get better. They expect to see what they're seeing in the world right now, and they expect it just to get worse and worse and worse until the time Jesus Christ comes again. Just listen to any of their radio programs, and you'll hear that that is always foremost in their minds. But I want us to consider this, that if these things have already happened, then they really don't present any obstacle to us for a glorious future. And I suggest to you that these things already have taken place. Now let's consider the 70 weeks of Daniel from another perspective, and we've already read the context of this uh, text. When Daniel was in Babylon, he realized the 70 years that were spoken by Jeremiah the prophet had been fulfilled. Again, the Lord drove them out of the land. The curse had come upon them because of their sins. God drove them out of the land so that the land could observe its Sabbaths, and that's why they were out of the land for 70 years. But now this time was fulfilled. The time of Jerusalem's desolation was over, and Daniel began to seek the Lord to know what his intentions were. Was he going to restore Jerusalem to his people and restore the temple and the worship of God? Well, the Lord answered Daniel's prayer by sending Gabriel, who revealed that the Lord, in fact, did have a plan, a plan that he would enact over a period of 70 weeks. Now, we understand that these 70 weeks are really not 70 weeks of, of seven days, but these are really 70 weeks of seven years. 
so that the whole plan would be enacted over a period of 490 years. Now, within that time, Jerusalem would be rebuilt, Messiah would come, he would complete his work and bring salvation to his people and in doing so fulfill all the Old Testament types and shadows and prophecies regarding him. Now, Gabriel tells Daniel these weeks would begin with the issuing of a decree to restore and rebuild Jerusalem, and they would end with the completion of the Messiah's work. By the way, there was a decree that was issued by Artaxerxes in 457 B.C. that completes the years that are mentioned in 30 A.D., when our Lord Jesus Christ laid down his life that he might take it up again to fulfill the scriptures and in doing so bring in everlasting righteousness. Now again, it's really the last week that is in question. Uh, with, it's the 70th week that we're looking at. What does it actually mean? Well, again, look at verses 27, 26 and 27. Then after 62 weeks, and by the way, this is the 62 weeks that follow the seven, first seven weeks, so we're actually talking about 69 weeks. After the 62 weeks, the Messiah will be cut off and have nothing. And the people of the prince who is to come will destroy the city and the sanctuary. And its end will come with a flood. Even to the end there will be war. Desolations are determined. And he will make a firm covenant with many for one week. But in the middle of the week, he will put a stop to sacrifice and grain offering. And on the wing of abominations will come one who makes desolate, even until a complete destruction, one that is decreed, is poured out on the one who makes desolate. Now, dispensationalists believe that what this text is talking about is that, is that uh, the Messiah is going to be cut off at the end of the 69 weeks. In other words, the 70th week is left wide open. The 69th week, 69th week ends with his being cut off. So at the end of 69 weeks, um, everything is fulfilled up to that point, but the 70th week is something yet to be fulfilled for the nation of Israel. Their rejection of Jesus Christ as their king puts... Daniel's clock or the 70th week on hold and projects it into the future thousands of years until the Lord again turns to Israel to deal with them, which he does after he raptures the church out of the world, and then the clock begins again, the 70th week starts. But I want you to notice in verse 27 where Gabriel says to Daniel, he will make a firm covenant with the many for one week. Now, what week is, is Gabriel referring to here? And I think we would all agree, dispensationalists and ourselves alike, he is talking about the 70th week that follows the 69 weeks. But who is it that is making this covenant? Dispensationalists would tell us that after the church is raptured, Antichrist appears. And Antichrist allows the Jews to do something they were not able to do up until this point, and that is rebuild their temple. So this is the Antichrist making a, um, a covenant with Israel that allows them to rebuild their temple. Remember that one of the most sacred shrines of Islam is now standing in the place where the temple used to stand, and they believe they need to build it there. Antichrist allows this to take place. But who is it that is really making this covenant in the text? Who is the he that is being referred to? It's actually not the Antichrist. It is referring to the Messiah, the prince who is coming. Because notice the closest antecedent to he who makes this firm covenant is the prince who is to come. And who is the prince that is being spoken of in this text? Well, the only prince that I can see is Messiah the prince who is mentioned in verse 25. You see, they see that. But they think the prince that is mentioned later in the text is some prince who is yet future, who is the Antichrist, because he is the prince to come. But Gabriel is talking about Messiah the prince, who is the one who is coming. Remember, he is coming uh, within that time frame of the 69 weeks. At the end of the 69 weeks, we have the presentation of Messiah. He is 
cut off after the 69 weeks. Now, what is it that he does in the middle of this 70th week? Well, he puts an end to sacrifice and grain offering. Dispensationalists believe that after Antichrist has made this covenant with the Jews to reestablish their temple, to rebuild it and reestablish the sacrifices, that after three and a half years, he is going to set up the abomination of desolation. He is going to put his own image in the temple and put an end to sacrifice and grain offering, and that is going to usher in the great tribulation. But what is it that really is going on here if the person who makes the covenant is the Messiah and not the Antichrist? The Messiah puts an end to sacrifice and grain offering. Now, how did Jesus Christ do that? He died on the cross. As verse 24 tells us, to make atonement for iniquity, to bring in everlasting righteousness, to seal up vision and prophecy, and to anoint the most holy, or for him to be anointed as Messiah and King over all creation. Now, I believe that when Jesus Christ was crucified, the Father very vividly illustrated the fact that, that the sacrifice and grain offering had been brought to an end when he took the veil of the temple in, and ripped it from top to bottom. He showed us that the Old Testament sacrificial system was now obsolete because Jesus Christ had fulfilled it. And when is it that that happened? It happened in 30 AD in the middle of the last week. Now Gabriel also tells Daniel what's going to happen next after the stopping of the sacrifice and the grain offering, though not in the 70th week, if you look again at verse 27. And on the wing of abominations will come one who makes desolate, even until a complete destruction. One that is decreed is poured out on the one who makes desolate. Actually, as we continue to look through Mark 13, we're going to see that what Gabriel is referring to here is the destruction of the temple in 70 AD. Notice verse 26. The people of the prince who is to come will destroy the city and the sanctuary. Well, who is this prince who is coming? It's the Messiah, our Lord Jesus Christ. Who are the people of the prince that are going to destroy the holy city and the sanctuary? It's actually the Roman army. The Lord often uses foreign armies to exact his judgments even upon his own people. He did that more than once. That's the reason why Babylon came and took Judah into captivity. The reason why Assyria took the northern kingdom of Israel into captivity. And why during the time of the judges, as you've been reading through the book of Judges, when the Lord wanted to judge his people, at least in, in the negative way, he would raise up a foreign army and bring them in and attack his people. And then they would call out to him. And then he would raise up a judge who would deliver them. But when he wanted to bring discipline, when he wanted to bring judgment, he did it through other foreign powers. They become his people, his instrument to do his will. The people of the prince who is to come is the Roman army who did, in fact, desecrate the holy city, made the temple desolate. They carried out his judgments. Now, really, the point I'm trying to make here is simple. What Gabriel is speaking about here is not something that is standing in our way in the future. It's something that has happened in the past. The 70th week has already been fulfilled. And so it doesn't stand in the way of an optimistic future. Our Lord Jesus Christ was cut off after the 62 weeks, which is, again, the 69 weeks. It was in the middle of the week he was cut off he was crucified. That brought an end to the sacrificial system. And then it projects into the future and talks about 70 AD. God was going to send an army, actually Messiah, was going to send an army against Jerusalem, destroy the city and the sanctuary. So again, past, not future. So we get back to the point again. Jesus is reigning now. He is in complete control of everything that's taking place and everything that happens in this world. His enemies are being subdued under his feet through the gospel and by the rod, or I should say by his rod of iron, as Psalm 1 refers to us or tells us. 
The distant future we know is going to be glorious because the Lord is going to bring this plan to fruition. All of his enemies are going to be subdued under his feet. But the immediate, the immediate future may also be glorious as the work of this subjection continues. Now again, I'm, I'm removing the obstacles that are in the way of this future. The Lord tells us there will be persecution, there will be tribulation, but we should expect that to happen during the time when the kingdom of darkness is more powerful than it, the Lord seems to indicate that it will be in the future, so we can expect persecution and tribulation to trail off as the kingdom of heaven advances. And passages such as Daniel 9 don't stand in our way either. Now we're going to go on, of course, to look at the Olivet Discourse just by way of quick review and the book of Revelation in particular to see that they don't stand in the way either. And we're going to look at that next week. But let's then, as we continue to see you know, what the Lord promises regarding his kingdom in the future, let's draw encouragement from this. If you don't know it's there, you can't draw encouragement from it. If you think that things are going to continue to go downward, then you're not going to be able to pray with the same kind of zeal and enthusiasm that you might otherwise pray with. You're not going to be able to reach out with a kind of expectation that God is going to work with you that you would have if you had this kind of hope. Again, I would remind you of what Jonathan Edwards told us in his Miscellany 351. There's a portion of it from last week. It is the manner of God to keep his church on earth in hope of a still more glorious state. So their prayers are enlivened when they pray that the interest of religion may be promoted and God's kingdom may come. It is a great encouragement to such endeavors to think that such times are coming when Christianity shall prevail over all enemies. That, by the way, the one quote that's in your bulletin that was displayed on the screen reminds us that in, in each phase as the kingdom of heaven moves forward, each successive phase is even more glorious than its preceding one. And that's something that continues. I believe Edwards tells us that the New Testament church is much more glorious than the Old Testament church. And I hope you all agree that that is the case. That when we get to heaven, that'll be more glorious than, than the church on earth. And once we're in heaven, when the new heavens and the new earth come, that's going to be even more glorious than what it's like in heaven before Jesus Christ returns and raises our bodies from the dead. But Edwards also points out from the encouragements given us in Scripture that this this latter state of the church before Jesus Christ comes again is going to be even more glorious than its inception or its beginning. So things continue to progress and they get better and better and better. And that gives us hope. It gives us an expectation of better things. And it gives us, again, the encouragement to pray and to labor that that kingdom would come. Now again, this is what the Word of God says. The way that we can apprehend it and actually that, that will actually make a difference in our lives is if we have faith. We have to believe it. We have to, of course, believe also in having trusted in Jesus Christ that we're a part of it and that what we do is going to make a difference in its coming in the world with power, that our prayers make a difference and that our witnessing makes a difference. If we don't have that expect expectation, if we don't have that hope, if we don't have that faith, then we're just going to sit in our chairs and do nothing. The Lord has given us these things to encourage us, but we do need to receive them by the kind of faith that we saw this morning. James tells us is a living faith, a faith that works, a faith that takes action, that acts upon what God's Word says. We need to have that kind of faith. We need to pray that God would fill our hearts with His Spirit so that we would have that kind of faith so that this would make us move forward. May God grant us then that grace. May He grant us that mercy and give us that kind of heart. That's something I think we all ought to be seeking, not only for ourselves, but also for one another.
Well, let's bow in a moment of uh, prayer and let's ask the Lord to give us such a heart and to build within us such an expectation so that we would make the very best use of our lives for the glory of God.